Okay, so welcome to our lecture on marine ecology. So this is a view of what you guys will be seeing when you go into the coral reef ecosystem in the marine world. So you have huge diversity here. You have corals and sponges. You can see a bunch of different types of fish. If we got even in closer, we'd see the invertebrates. All sorts of biodiversity on the coral reef. They are the water or the ocean's equivalent of a tropical rainforest. The greatest biodiversity in the ocean is located on the coral reefs. So what we want to do is talk about the ecology of the marine ecosystem and we're, we're for the most part going to focus mostly on the coral reef aspect of the marine ecosystem. There are a lot of different habitats within the marine ecosystem. Our primary focus is going to be the reef system. So with ecology, when we look at marine ecology, ecology is a field of science in which we study the interaction between the living and non-living aspects, aspects of an area. Okay, so you got living and non-living. So the other terms we'll see used for this are biotic, when we talk about living, and abiotic, when we talk about non-living. So in our little picture here of the little turtle, the green turtle, that's the living. Okay, so we got our turtle here, and the turtle is alive. Give him a little smile there. That is a biotic component of the reef ecosystem. Now the water, the water temperature, the water salinity, the amount of sunlight, all of those things are the non-living or what we call abiotic aspects of an area. So all these things connect and interact when we look at ecology. So living influences the non-living and the non-living then influences the living. So there's a circular relationship. So if we have abiotic here, the water temperature quality, etc., influences the biotic. Why do we find turtles in certain parts of the reef, certain parts of the ocean? It's because of the abiotic conditions allow them to survive there. And then the turtles, the biotic aspects, will influence the abiotic. So as a turtle eats things, it poops and it changes the water quality. As it moves around, it stirs the water up. It can stir up sediment from the bottom. That changes the amount of sunlight that can get through the water. So these two things constantly interact. That again is the nature of ecology, is to study these interactions between these two. And as one changes, it influences the other. So if your water temperature changes, that influences the, what can live there. If the population of turtles goes up or goes down, that influences the non-living aspects of that given area. Right, so that is the goal with ecology. With marine ecology, we are applying that study to the marine ecosystem. So when we explore the ecosystems and ecology, we always look at populations. Now, population will be all of the individuals of the same species in a given area. Right, so we're going to focus on lionfish. What's the population of lionfish? How many lionfish are there? How many males? How many females? Juveniles? Adults? Etc. So we have to look at populations. But as we continue to expand our study, we then look at the community, which when we focus on community ecology, We are going to look at all the populations of different species living in a given area. Okay, so how do all these different species interact? 
How are the lionfish interacting with the corals? How are the lionfish interacting with the little damselfish? What about the sea turtles? What about the sponges? How do all these different things interact and connect within the marine ecosystem? All right, so a big thing to study and look at and to try to identify within a marine ecosystem is the habitat. What is the physical place that a species will live? All right, so when we look at this, we have to look at the abiotic and biotic conditions that influence where species lives. So do they live in the shallows? Maybe they live in water that's only four to five feet deep. Do they live in deeper areas, 30 to 60 feet? Do they live in areas of heavy wave action or areas of light wave action? So what kind of habitat does the organism live in or the species live in? And it's not just one habitat. It's not as if most species are restricted to just one narrow little habitat. A lot of times they span multiple habitats. So for example with our lionfish, lionfish can live in turtle grass beds, they can live in mangroves, they can live on the front part of the reef where it gets really deep, 300 meters, they can live in the shallow part of the reef where it's only five or six feet. So they can live in a lot of different habitats a lot of different places. So that is, again, a big piece of information when we study ecology. We need to look at the habitats. And then what are the abiotic conditions that determine the habitat? And then also the biotic conditions that determine the habitat. So what's your producer base, your food sources, things like that. Now as we continue to study things like lionfish or turtles or manatees or whatever we want to try really strongly try to understand the ecological niche of every species so when we talk about ecological niche the role let me put that in quotes the role that a species plays within a community what does it do what's its job is it a carnivore? Is it a producer? Etc. What what is its ecological job? Now, please do not, and I'll stress this, do not say the ecological role of a queen conch is to provide humans with food. That's not the ecological role or the ecological niche. The niche is what is the natural job or role of that species. So when we look at this, we have to look at all of the resources that the species uses and the way it grows and the way it reproduces and all those variables. We have to take all those into consideration when we look at the ecological niche. In general, sharks are top level predators. That is their ecological niche. They sit on the top of most food chains in the marine ecosystem. They maintain prey populations and they have this incredibly important role. They're balancing an ecosystem because of their ecological niche or their job. Now lionfish, top level predator in well, I should say one of the top level predators in their native environment. Now, when they get into the Caribbean environment, that becomes a problem because their job, they're competing against lots of other species and out competing them because they are an invasive species. And that is a huge, huge issue. Okay, so as we explore marine ecology, we're going to look at this and we're going to study it at different levels and we'll talk about populations, look at population growth, we'll talk about interactions between species, all these different things as we go through marine ecology here. So, okay, so let's start out with populations. Now population, as we mentioned before, is 
all the individuals of the same species in a given area. Now, for a population to grow, they need certain resources. And there are certain things that limit their growth. So things that limit their growth, we call limiting factors or limited resources. So this could be things like, okay, so what prevents these butterfly fish here from increasing their population? Things like food slash nutrients. So how much food's available? If you don't have anything to eat, it's hard to have offspring and it's hard for your population to grow. What about physical factors? Things like light. So those corals, are they getting enough sunlight to grow, to reproduce, to sustain themselves? What about the salinity or salt concentration? If that changes, that can influence and impact growth. Corals, they need a hard substrate for their growth. Without something solid to lock onto, corals can't get started. The polyps can't grow. They can't develop. So if there's nothing solid for a coral polyp to begin life on, it doesn't grow. Population doesn't increase. Um, things like space. How much physical room is there? There's only so much room. And if you run out of room, your population doesn't get bigger. Uh, what about things like oxygen? Carbon dioxide? etc. You know, depending on if you're a producer, you need a certain level of carbon dioxide. If you're a consumer, you better have enough oxygen. Uh, we could throw in predators. The more predators you have, the harder it is for your population to grow. Diseases. Lots of diseases control populations and limit their growth. Consider the bubonic plague, what it did to humans hundreds of years ago control our growth for quite a while. Parasites. I'm just going to say etc. here. This list could go on and on and on. You could add dozens and dozens of things that limit population growth. So the key is when we're studying the population and looking at the growth, the more of these limiting factors that are removed, the easier it is for the population to grow. The more factors, limiting factors that are present, the harder it is for a population to grow. And these factors are changing constantly. It's never static, it's never stable. There's always more diseases, less diseases, increase in parasites, decrease, salt levels change, light levels change. So there's constant movement and change when we look at these populations and population growth. But something we want to try to establish for a given habitat is the carrying capacity. Okay, so carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals an area can support. How many fish can survive on the reef? How many coral polyps can live? There's so much space, there's only going to be so much amount of life that it can sustain. Nutrients. How many can live based on the availability of nutrients? So something to consider when we're looking at carrying capacity and looking at populations. So as your populations go up, they start consuming more and more resources, which means in this case nutrients. The resource availability decreases. Now there's an intersection here where, right there, where you're at a perfect balance, the availability of nutrients and the population size. But the problem is, if your population continues to grow, you start to deplete your resources. And you continue to deplete your resources because there's not enough being produced to sustain the growth. Now, eventually, populations tend to level off at what we call carrying capacity. Natural leveling occurs if humans don't monkey around with it. And the population levels and kind of stabilizes at a point we know as carrying capacity. So what we're going to look at as we get into our next set of lectures is what happens when populations don't level off at carrying capacity and different growth patterns and things like that that we'll see within populations.